Well, there has certainly been a lot going on in the news this week. But I hope you haven't missed, in the midst of all of it, the speech given by Greta Thunberg to the United Nations. Greta is a young, tiny, 16-year-old Swedish girl. And she has begun what has turned into an international student movement of school strikes in order to encourage our world's leaders to do something about climate change. As I watched her and listened to her, I couldn't help but think about the prophet Jeremiah. Now, I'm sure that's what came to mind for you, right? <laughs> Do you remember a few weeks ago when we heard God's call to Jeremiah? God said, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Well, Greta was certainly the prophet this week. She lamented, as the prophets do, the consequences of our actions for the future of our climate. She wasn't predicting the future. She was just lamenting the consequences to be. Like Jeremiah and the other prophets, her message has not been received real well by a lot of those in power. There's been a lot of backlash on social media. Many have ridiculed her. Others have sort of patted her on the head and patronized her. Well, Jeremiah's message was not being received real well either. <clears throat> Jeremiah was um, <clears throat> under house arrest in the palace. We know the exact year that Jeremiah made this purchase of property. We're told that it was the 10th year of the reign of King Zedekiah. So that would have been 586 BCE. That was the year of the destruction of Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar's army had surrounded the city of Jerusalem for two years and besieged them. And the conditions in Jerusalem were horrific. The city was ravaged by disease, by starvation. When the Babylonian army finally battered down the gates and breached the walls, they took the people captive, they looted the city, and then they burned it to the ground. If you think about pictures you have seen in the news recently of starving children in Yemen, of the rubble that is all that's left after the bombings of places like Mosul and Aleppo, that was Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah's family owned a piece of property outside of the city, not far. But it was worthless at this point. It had to have been occupied by the Babylonians. But Jeremiah's cousin comes to him with a deal. Now, we think Jeremiah's cousin was just sort of looking for money to get out of Dodge and flee to Egypt. But he comes to Jeremiah and says, you are the first in line to be able to buy this property. You have the right of first refusal. It's really kind of comical, because like, who else was going to buy it? Um, one of the commentators I read jokingly said, it was a depressed real estate market. <laughs> Jeremiah um, lamented, like Greta, 
Jeremiah had lamented long and loud about the actions, the consequences of the actions of Judah's kings. He sort of was uh, a private, he was sort of always sort of swimming upstream when the people were, felt secure with their idols and their foreign alliances, he was roaring judgment at them. But now that they're defeated and the end has come, amazingly, his message turns to one of hope. He buys this piece of property in a very public way. Even though he's imprisoned in the palace under house arrest, he um, very deliberately goes through all of these actions out in the court of the guards where they can be observed by everyone. He deliberately weighs out the number of shekels for the purchase. He has a deed drawn up and with witnesses signs it in the presence of everyone for all to see. And then he has Baruch put the deed into an earthenware jar, he says, so that it will last for a long time. Now we know that things in earthenware jars do last for a long time. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in the same kind of earthenware jars after 2,000 years. So Jeremiah had a plan. He was living out, acting out his faith, his hope that despite all appearances to the contrary, this was not the end. When I hear those words, um, earthen jars, I can't help but think of the Apostle Paul's words to the Corinthians. He was talking about the light of Christ and he said, he called it a treasure, and he said we have this treasure in earthen vessels, meaning that we have this light, this treasure in us, this faith, this hope. So you and I are those vessels. We are the bearers. We are the keepers of hope, of faith in God's future. Jeremiah also told those exiles who were being carried away to Babylon that they should buy property there that they should build houses there, build long-term houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat the produce of them, get married there, have children there, work for the good of Babylon, pray on their behalf. Those exiles were to be bearers of light, those exiles were to be a blessing to Babylon because Babylon's future and their future were bound together. The parable in today's gospel lesson is also prophetic. It is a loud roar about the consequences of how we use our wealth. And it uh, makes us pretty uncomfortable, doesn't it? We always ask ourselves, you know, where do I, where, who am I in this parable? Well, most of us don't see ourselves as excessively rich. We 
manage, we get along, but um, we watch what we spend, we look for sales, we try not to waste our money. But the rich man in this story, he was super rich, sort of like the Jeff Bezos of Jerusalem. He, um, this poor man was lying at his, quote, gates, but the word used for gates wasn't like the little picket fence gate. The word used for gates were these huge, majestic portals. So he must have lived in quite the mansion. We're told that he wore purple, and purple was a color reserved for royalty, so that was a small, exclusive group who wore purple. And his robes were made of the finest linen, the Armani suits, I guess, of his time. He feasted sumptuously, not just on special occasions. He feasted sumptuously every day. Well, we don't think we're him, but we sure don't want to be Lazarus either. We don't want to be the poor man. He was starving. He was a beggar. He was covered with sores. He was so weak that he couldn't even fend off the stray dogs. So maybe the safest place to be in this story is to be one of those siblings who still has a chance. This is not a new message. Luke, from the very beginning of his gospel, conveys an overarching concern for the poor and the marginalized. All the way back in chapter 1 in Mary's Magnificat, we hear that the mighty will be pulled down from their thrones and the lowly will be lifted up. That the hungry will be filled with good things. The rich will be sent away empty. We hear from Luke, um, the rich young ruler, all he needs to do is sell everything he has and give the money to the poor. We hear Jesus tell the disciples that it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than to get in, or for a camel, sorry, <laughs> the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And last week, do you remember Renee talking about mammon? And Jesus teaching that we cannot serve both God and wealth. In all of the parables we know that Jesus told, even the most beloved ones, the prodigal son and, and the good Samaritan in Luke, none of the characters in those parables have a name. Those parables are stories and the characters in them are uh, images, they're representatives or archetypes or examples, except in this one parable where the poor man is given a name, Lazarus. Now, it's not the Lazarus that Jesus raises from the dead. The poor in this story are someone we are to know by name. We are to know that they are a person. The poor are real people with names. They're not just statistics. Oh, and speaking of statistics, did you hear in the news this week that in America, the gap between the rich and the poor 
is the greatest it has ever been since we started keeping those kinds of records. We see poverty as a problem to be addressed. We see it as the consequence of an unjust economic system. We want to change the system, but how? It seems overwhelming. We ask our political candidates what their strategies are for reducing the disparity in income. We care about poverty. We care um, about the poor. We certainly don't want to be poor. But it's easy, it's so easy for us to see the poor as them. Friends, there is no them. There is only us. To change the system, we have to begin with changing our hearts. We are called to recognize that we are one with the poor. We're called to know them, know them by name, to befriend them, to value them, to see Christ in them not just to feed the poor, but to invite them to eat with us, for us all to eat together. This week in one of his um, daily devotions, Richard Rohr um, shared a quote from Thomas Merton Thomas Merton wrote about this in a book uh, that he titled Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. I think a good title might have been Conjectures of a Guilty Rich Person. He describes an experience he had in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, the headquarters of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church is located in Louisville, Kentucky. So I have had occasion to be in Louisville. The place where Thomas Merton was when he had this experience was right in the middle of downtown, uh, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut. And if you go to that place today, there's actually a monument to Thomas Merton about his experience and what he has written about it in this story or in his book. At any rate, he says, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all of these people. That they were mine and I was theirs. That we couldn't be alien to one another. I am one with them. There are no strangers. They are my own self. I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I love all the poor. That they are mine and I am theirs. That we're not them and us. I am one with them. They are my own self. This chasm to be overcome between the rich man and Lazarus, this chasm, Richard Rohr would say, is the illusion that we are separate, that we're separate from God, that we are separate from one another. We can't be rich on our own, no matter how much money we have. 
that kind of life isn't full, it's empty. We can't have abundant life all by ourselves. The more that we give away, the richer our lives become. And our future is not dependent on our wealth. Our future is dependent on our relationships. The future of rich and poor is one future. We are bound together. We can't be rich on our own. We can't change the climate on our own. We are all in this together. And the future of our climate, of our planet, perhaps of humankind, is in all of us realizing that we are one and that our lives and our futures are bound together. Each week, we say the words, we who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. At the table, when bread is broken, the walls that separate us are broken down. When the cup is poured, God's love that unites us is poured out. When we come to the table, rich, poor, young, old, male, female, gay, straight, conservative, liberal, black, brown, white. When we come to the table, we are one. We share one bread, one cup, one life, one love. In Christ, we are bound together in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.